In the light of the ongoing investigation to the pork barrel scandal, many are wondering how someone can have opened numerous corporations or businesses, especially under false names or with names of members who weren't aware that they were and are therefore now included in the list of people to be filed cases against. Filing cases against individuals who are the heads or members or shareholders of a legit company is called piercing the corporate veil. What is the logic behind piercing the corporate veil? What are the factors that the courts have to consider when ruling if a company's veil can be pierced? How will ordinary citizens benefit from piercing the corporate veil of a company? Good evening. You are watching Legal Help Desk on the Solar News Channel. This show is about making the law work for you by giving legal advice on topics that matter to you. I'm attorney Karen Jimeno. And I'm attorney Rod Nepomuceno. Tonight, we will be discussing on the topic of piercing the corporate veil fiction. Our guest for tonight is attorney Vincent Cruz of the Gambionza de Santos and Partners Law Firm. Good evening and thank you for being with us. Attorney Maybe. Vincent. Attorney Vince. Yes. yes. All right. Vince, All right. Vince, Vince Thank you for having yeah. me here in our An show. Yeah. Another relevant topic, no? piercing the, uh, the, the corporate, corporate veil, as, yes. they, as, they, as they say it. No? Kasi, uh -oh. Especially it, now it, with the NGOs, the fake NGOs na involved in the support by the alleged. Scams. The alleged fake NGOs. Yes, we okay, alleged, <laughs> yeah. Alleged fake them. NGOs. So a lot of yeah. people are asking, kung fake naman yung stockholders, yung presidents, and sino nga habulin, di ba? So, yes. it's a good but, question. But maybe you should establish first, no? Yung, the general rule, when you set up a corporation, what does that mean, essentially? When you set up a corporation, what does that mean in re with respect to the, its shareholders and directors and officers? Yes. Actually, our topic today, which is piercing the doctrine of piercing the veil of corporate fiction, takes its cue from another doctrine in corporate law, which is the doctrine of uh, separate juridical personality. This doctrine provides that uh, a corporation, which is a legal entity, is separate and distinct from the stockholders and members mm -hmm. which comprise the corporation and including also the officers. Mm -hmm. Otherwise stated, this means that uh, the corporation cannot be held liable mm -hmm. for the obligations of its stockholders and members in the same way that the stockholders and members cannot be held liable for any or all obligations of the corporation. So if, in this instance, for example, if a, if a corporation, let's say, goes bankrupt no, and then wala na pera, di ba? Um, and it has creditors, uh, the creditors cannot go against the personal property of the shareholders, stockholders, based on the general rule, right? Yes, then uh, that's when the doctrine of piercing the veil of corporate fiction uh, takes its application or steps in. If it can be proven that the corporate entity is used to defeat public conven convenience, justify wrong, protect fraud, or defend crime, then that corporate entity will be disregarded and the, the claimants or the offended parties can go after the stockholders mm. for the obligations of the corporation. Mm -hmm. So normally, when you have a corporation that does something wrong, you should file a case directly against the corporation, union respondent. Mm -hmm. But yes. with piercing the veil of corporate fiction, Instead of filing it against the corporation, you can file it directly against the stockholders. You can file it against the corporation and the So you have to allege both corporation and stockholders. Preferably, Preferably both, so that you can you have a better chance of okay. uh, mm -hmm. claiming your uh, your pecuniary claim. No, in, in what in what instances, uh, Tony Vince, can you can you apply? Yeah, this can doctrine? you apply this when you pierce? In other words. When you say piercing the veil of corporate fiction, you're actually disregarding the corporation altogether, yes. the, the juridical personality of the corporation, and you're going after the shareholders, the officers, and executives. In what, what instances? Are there conditions that you can pierce, you can pierce through the, or disregard the, the corporate uh, personality? You know? Well, uh, as a general rule, when there is fraud committed mm -hmm. on a person, on a, for, or an employee, mm -hmm. or a third person of the company, then you can pierce the veil of corporate fiction and go against the stockholders. General rule, there should, well, in the line of Supreme Court cases, there should be fraud committed by the company before you can go after the, before you can go after the stockholders and the members who comprise the, mm -hmm. the, the corporation. There are also instances where the Supreme Court uh, com completely disregarded the corporate fiction simply because uh, it, it, the, other, the, the other corporation is merely a conduit or an alter ego 
of the other corporation, which for our purposes is the stockholder mm -hmm. of that corporation. Mm -hmm. So those are the instances where you apply it. Basically, when you go after the mm -hmm. corporation for a pecuniary claim or monetary claim. I see. Okay, and this is also apply for um, criminal cases? Yes, uh, as a general rule, you cannot file a criminal case against a corporation, mm -hmm. but uh, you can go against the officers provided that there is a law which, which holds the, such officers criminally liable for corporate acts. Mm. What about certain acts wherein the law provides that in case of violation, the corporation should be liable for certain penalties? So under special laws, for instance, can you then impose the penalty against the stockholders themselves if you find out that basically the corporation is again um, being used just uh, as a what you call this like a again a veil against yeah. those really at fault well that is a matter of evidence for so long as you can clearly and convincingly show that the corporation was is being used merely as a conduit mm. to commit fraud or to justify wrong then mm. that's the time when the court will step in to pierce that corporate entity and go after the stockholders okay. so and they the can members who comprise claim it. the penalty directly from the shareholders or yes no. okay. as you were saying no, alter ego no, is, is one yes. no? sometimes when people just set up their and it's not uncommon, no? I can set up a company called uh, the Rod Nepomuceno Incorporated or John Clements, for example. I mean, he, it's his name. Uh, he lends his name and then, and then eventually he puts Incorporated. But that's possible, right? Yes. Uh, meaning that's recognized. That in itself, let's say I own, let's say, 90, 96% and I just give, as to Incorporate, I give 1% to four other people. So that's sufficient for an incorporation, no? five people. Uh, that in itself will not lend itself to piercing the corporate veil. For example, the BAR is running after <coughs> me. Um, I can always claim, well, that's not my tax liability. It's the corporation's tax liability, and so I sh uh, BAR shouldn't go after me. Can I? Can or should? Will the BAR in that case, since I own ninety six percent of it, it's practically mine, will consider me one and the same? In a long line of cases, the Supreme Court held that just because you are a majority stockholder. Mm -hmm of the corporation doesn't necessarily mean that the corporation is a million alter ego, alter ego. Mm -hmm. again you should allege fraud fraud uh. or you should allege that it is merely created to defeat public convenience mm -hmm. or mean or created to for for example tax avoidance purposes mm -hmm. which is not necessarily illegal not, not but, illegal yeah no. but then again uh you have an uh, obligation to, to pay your taxes properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. while it's not illegal to set mm -hmm. up uh, another corporation which you practically own mm -hmm. or which you majority, uh, which majority of the shares of which you own, it doesn't necessarily mean that the court will step in to, to pierce the corporate veil and hold you personally liable for whatever obligations that corporation uh, enters into. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, mm -hmm. if so, given that scenario, no, I, let's say I refuse to give myself a salary in that corporation. Let's say it's a Radley yes. Pumuseno Incorporated. Oh, I refuse to give myself a salary because questions. salaries uh, are, are taxed well, big, no? like yes. 30%. Right? And dividends are, are probably taxed, are, are taxed much less. Yes. In that case, will the BR come in and say, ah, no, you only put that as an alter ego and we're going to tax you as a, uh, it as a 30%. It depends. <laughs> so it yeah, depends on the depends. If okay. it is obvious that you are just using it to avoid your obligations, your legal obligations as a corporation mm -hmm. or your legal obligations under different laws like labor laws, then the court will step in and say na, oh, you're using it as an alter ego, uh, you have to, okay. well, you have to disregard the corporate fiction we will hold you directly liable. All right. Uh, we have some questions, uh, Attorney Vince. Now we have some questions from our, from our viewers. Let's try to answer them uh, with the help of our guests, of course. We start with Celine who asks, what was the logic behind the doctrine? Does, the, does that mean, or this mean, does this mean that any company can be made accountable if I was a stockholder? What are the red flags that I have to look out for, if any? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the logic behind this doctrine is basically another doctrine in corporate law which provides that the corporation is a juridical entity separate and distinct from the stockholders and mm -hmm. members who comprise it. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's the main doctrine. Right. But if that corporation is used to, like I said, to justify wrong, uh, prevent, uh, to defeat public convenience, protect fraud, then that's the time when the corporate fiction or the legal entity will be disregarded and it will be considered as an association of persons. 
Thus, you can hold the stockholders and the members who comprise it liable for the acts which were purportedly transacted by the corporation itself. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And our next question is from Neil and he asks, in what scenarios or circumstances can the doctrine piercing the veil of corporate fiction be applied to? How big of a corporation does it have to be for the court to intervene? The size matter, and you uh -oh. basically thrust the question. No, usually, actually, the doctrine of piercing the veil usually applies to smaller corporations because in that case, we only have five stockholders who are, mm -hmm. some relatives pa, mm -hmm. So, basically, they are the ones who control that corporation. Unlike bigger corporations who have millions of stockholders or thousands of stockholders, then it's hard to, mm -hmm. to, to pin really liability after. on the stockholders, which are basically the public, mm -hmm. So, usually, it applies to smaller corporations, but, but it can apply to all B corporations, oh. regardless of size. Regardless of size, yes. all right. Now, Sam wants to know, how does fraud or staffa come into play in the piercing of the corporate veil? Well, like, like I said, general rule, you cannot hold uh, a corporation, corporation liable for criminal acts. But, Even for a staffa, uh, for example. Cannot, yes, uh, but if, uh, if the officer who acted beyond the scope of his authority transacted with another person, which it's tantamount to a staffa, then you can go after that particular officer who committed the criminal act mm -hmm. and caused you damage by taking your money or embezzling your money, mm -hmm. which is, constitutes a staffa. Okay. Well, very exciting topic, right. no? Yes. <laughs> and uh, we have more questions for you, but let's yeah. take a short break. Legal Help Desk will return after these messages. You are still watching Legal Help Desk on the Solar News Channel, and we are still joined by our guest, Attorney Vincent Cruz of the Gabionza de Santos and Partners. Yeah. Good okay, evening, so Attorney I'm st Vince. still in the corp, uh, piercing uh -oh. the corporate veil. Yeah. I have some mm -hmm. questions that mm -hmm. are based on mm -hmm. um, some events that have happened in the Philippines. So, mm -hmm. one is I've heard of a certain uh, public utility, passenger mm -hmm. vessel, mm -hmm. na natalo in a case because their ship sank and mm -hmm. then they had claimants uh, that were allegedly not paid. And from what I heard, uh, this shipping company basically just declared bankruptcy na hindi pa nababayaran yung claimants. And then um, they formed a new corporation apparently with the same owners and then even with the same vessels with the same names. So is this a case where you can apply this doctrine of piercing the corporate veil? Well, of course, it depends on the circumstances. Mm -mm. In a long line of Supreme Court cases, there have been certain uh, probative factors which have been looked into to determine whether or not another corporation is just a conduit or an alter ego of another corporation for a purpose, let's say, a subsidiary corporation or a parent corporation. Now, if it can be proven that the, for example, the, the stockholders and the owners of the second corporation are the same as that of the first corporation or that they occupy the same uh, the same office building and that they have the same employees mm -mm. those are certain red flags to, mm -mm. to show that this is just a conduit or an alter or ego basically of the, a way for them to avoid yes and then that that's when that question steps in na, na is that second corporation or the new corporation being used to avoid the obligations of the first if that can be clearly and convincingly shown, then the corporate veil will be pierced and then you can hold the new corporation liable for the obligations of the former, of the former mm -hmm. corporation. What about instances where yung tinatawag nila nagsara na yung dating mm -hmm. kumpanya? So this happened like with pyramiding scams, di ba? Like basically, or even some employees minsan, yeah. if they lose in a big labor case and you have all of these unpaid employees, tapos gagawin na lang nagsasara yung um, corporation. So in this case, kung kahit kung hindi sila magtayo ng bagong corporation, but you have the old owners just basically closing the corporation to escape liability. 
uh, what would be the resort of those claimants or victims? Kanura, could the body is a pyramid scam? Ganyan yeah. nangyari, nagsasara na wala na silang mahabol. Well, I believe there's another corporate law aspect which applies to this, which is the closure of the corporation. Mm -hmm. For example, kung nag-close naman yung company and then there was a proper dissolution, mm -hmm. then maybe that company can be absolved from liability. But again, it's a matter of evidence. If you can, again, clearly and convincingly show that, that there was fraud committed by closing the former company and opening a new one just to avoid the liabilities to the victims of the first company, then necessarily mm. the court will step in mm. and pierce that corporate veil, I so to speak. I have this question. I, I know that we've been talking about uh, essentially a, a corporation or perhaps an individual controlling another corporation, yes. right? That's one, the control. The next is the fraud. But the third aspect to it is that there has to be harm proven, diba? It, it, correct me if I'm wrong. You, ha you have to prove that there was some harm uh, that, was, that, was, uh, that befell the petitioner. Yes. Uh, how do you define yung harm? Loss or loss of uh, money? Yeah. Or? So far as harm is concerned, it applies basically to piercing cases which fall under the classification of fraud cases. Fraud cases. Uh, okay. We are taught in law school that there are three kinds of piercing cases. Number one is the fraud cases. Number two is the alter ego cases. Number three is the, the equity, equity cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Equity cases is sort of a catch-all mm -hmm. which may apply to both fraud and alter ego cases. Mm -hmm. While fraud cases, you must show that there was a pecuniary harm oh. or, or damage to a person whether or not he's, whether he's an employee mm -hmm. or, another, or a third person of which the corporation had a transaction with. So you have to prove that harm, that the yes. harm happened, right? In so far as fraud cases are concerned. Oh. But for alter ego cases, there are some, li there are some Supreme Court decisions which, which um, pierce the corporate veil, so to speak, because it defeated public convenience, for, for, for example, for tax avoidance purposes, mm -hmm. but not necessarily that, that fraud was present. Mm -hmm. it, it basically, when you talk about fraud cases, it can be one transaction alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for alter ego cases, there must be a systematic disregard mm -hmm. of the separate corporate legal entity which is given to the corporation. Mm -hmm. Can you give a, a concrete example? Uh, maybe, a, maybe perhaps a case you handled, maybe a Supreme Court case of, of this alter ego or itong, itong, uh, conduit, so well, to speak. Uh, yeah. There's this famous case that most probably most students, most law students know. There's this a co company which has which which uh, manufactures coffee, mm -hmm. and then it also opened a company which manufactures starch. Mm -hmm. So what happened there is that they have the same owners, they have the same factory, mm -hmm. they have the same employees, and the employees are used interchangeably. Now, the employees what they did was they petitioned for an increase in wages. So with the with the with a certain with the cert, with the proper court, now the coffee company allegedly uh, with the, the, well sorry the employees filed a case against the coffee and the starch company mm -hmm. all together. Mm -hmm. Now the defense of that company was that we are separate companies. You don't have jurisdiction to claim increase of wages because we are we are two separate companies. And then the Supreme Court said no no. You're Basically, really one. the pro pro probative factors are there, and they will treat you as a single entity. The same director, same same owners. Because because of the fact that they're same director, same mm -hmm. owners, mm -hmm. and the and and even the, the conduct of business. Okay, mm -hmm. and what about cases where the shareholders themselves are dummies, meaning, parang sinama lang sila sa corporation as shareholders, but they're really shareholders that don't exercise any rights. So, Are parang you, fake yeah. shareholders. <laughs> parang you're referring to a particular case uh, that's uh, uh, instant. <laughs> that's uh, kind of popular yeah, now. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, sometimes, there, diba, isa oh nang talaga yung may ari. But that's then, an interesting, since to incorporate, you need five mm, people. That's they an interesting get question, other yeah. shareholders. And then, of course, when you pierce the corporate veil, it sounds like you can sue all the shareholders. Can you, can the others then say, wala kaming kasalanan because we really don't take part in this corporation. Mm -mm. They just... Oh, they there. just put the name. They just yeah. put my name. Someone else put me there as president. Someone else put me there as manager. But I'm not really part of that. So yeah. they're now piercing the corporate veil of, of this oh, company and going after me. Because the company, for instance, was used for fraud. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Well, that's a matter of defense for the <laughs> oh. stockholders. Okay. As a general rule, of course, you can go after the stockholders mm -hmm. using the using the doctrine of so using the veil. So, in the first instance, as soon as the complaint is filed, if there are the requirements are present for piercing the corporate veil, the case is filed against the corporation and all the stockholders. Kahit yes. na these are stockholders who really don't take part in the corporation. If your theory is that the stockholders have exclusive control over the company, then yes, you yeah. can. Okay. That's, that's so you have to be the, careful, no? Kung saan ginagamit yung name mo. Yeah. 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 Now, yeah. how about wholly owned? Wholly owned subsidiaries. Diba, you have parent companies sometimes wholly owned subsidiaries. That's valid, right? I mean, there, there, are, com there are companies, let's say holding companies, who, yeah. who maybe practically own 100% of a subsidiary. Uh, that's, that in itself is not wrong, right? Yes, and there's like, like you mentioned earlier, just because mm -hmm. uh, a holding company owns substantially all or the whole mm -hmm. subsidiary company doesn't necessarily... Right. Does it necessarily entail the application yeah. of the doctrine of piercing, of piercing. the veil? Of in other words, we'll still treat them as two corporations yes. for all intents and purposes. Yes, and unless it can again, it can be proven mm. that 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 such subsidiary yeah. corporation is used doing some fraud, to no? commit fraud. Or all right. Commit. Now we have uh, a couple of questions uh, and uh, from Jan, and he asks, "Will the directors, incorporators, officers, stockholders who are legitimately part of the corporation be automatically held liable for any crimes committed?" by the corporation? What are the possible defenses that can be used by these people if the corporation is involved in a crime or an illegal act? You were mentioning earlier, a corporation, can it yes. be subject to General a criminal? General rule, a corporation cannot be held criminally liable mm. for, for, a, for a crime, but mm. the officers can be held criminally liable mm -hmm. if, there is a, if there is a law which mm -hmm. provides criminal liability for corporate acts of, certain, of those officers. Mm. Mm. All right, I see. So, okay. Of course, common sense. You can't jail a, mm -hmm. a you can't company. jail a company yeah. because oh, it's just a, a an artificial being uh -huh. uh, that's defined by the corporation code. Mm -hmm. So, in in, in terms of criminal cases, you really go after, uh -huh. you really go after the officers and the members or the stockholders who mm -hmm. who committed who who committed the acts which mm -hmm. constitutes the crime. Mm -hmm. Well, since Rod already mentioned illegal acts, someone yes. also asked earlier that what. What do you do with, for instance, these fake NGOs that uh, are involved in the pork barrel scam? Uh, is it illegal, since they committed illegal acts, well, by fraud, diba? Right? Because uh, they basically used pork barrel when they're not real NGOs. Yeah. Can you go after the shareholders of these entities? Actually, this Very question good. named specifically yung case daw ni na yeah. na she named certain uh, drivers as presidents yes. of the corporation and some shareholders are also yung mga kasambahay nila or assistants. Mm -hmm. So, what would be the liability of the corporation and the shareholders in this case and Napolis? I think the, the thing with this Napolis case is that it is not the NGOs which are corporations who are being run after. Mm -hmm. It's basically Napolis as a person. As a person. Or as the perpetrator, who are they running? Up, who are who they are running after? So the police is the person who used these corporations or set yes. up these corporations. So that is the theory of the case against. Or allegedly. Uh, uh, yeah, allegedly the theory of the case against the police that she used these corporations so that she could accumulate, so, so that she could accumulate the money from the, from from the well PDAF. Mm -hmm. So technically speaking, you're not going against the NGOs mm -hmm. and the stockholders who comprise it. You're mm -hmm. going after Napolis who use those NGOs. But for purposes, for example, if, if it's a forfeiture case, then technically you can't go after the NGO because like the facts show that, that the NGOs did not receive any money. Mm -hmm. it, went okay. to, it went straight to the proponent who is... Uh -oh. uh, Napolis, yeah. allegedly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and now we only have a few minutes left. Maybe we can use this to give a recap of what we have discussed so far for the benefit of our viewers. So, again, maybe we can give yeah. a recap. Give a First, recap of what, what a corporation what we, is. Yeah, we need to learn rule? today. Na general rule, the corporation is separate from the shareholders. So, if you have a case against a corporation, you cannot go after shareholders. Uh, you can't file the case against shareholders. But... Uh, Attorney Vince, you can maybe give a recap na in case uh, iisa lang yung mga may-ari talaga and the corporation is being used for fraud or to defeat 
basically valid claims, then you can go after the shareholders. Maybe you can highlight the red flags. Yes, well, like you mentioned, as a general rule, you cannot go after the stockholders of a corporation for corporate acts. But if it can be proven that such corporation was was created or is merely a conduit uh, to defeat public convenience, justify wrong, protect fraud, or defend crime, then you can go after then the the, the doctrine which provides that it has a personality separate and distinct from from its stockholders and members will be disregarded, and then in that case you can go after the stockholders for allegedly corporate acts. So that is basically uh, how to put the piercing doctrine all in, piercing, in context. In, in, yeah, into in context, right yes. Context. yes. All right. Okay. Now, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for tonight. Uh, we'd like to thank our guest, Attorney Vincent Cruz of the Gabionza de Santos and Partners. I'm Attorney Rod de Pomuceno. And I'm Attorney Karen Jimeno. Join us again next Monday as we discuss your legal rights. Good night.